this area is the GS3 in North Wales. And up there, exactly the same, we are restricted to being under the estuary because there are petroleum licenses on the onshore part. So there have been a few concerns mentioned this afternoon. I wouldn't dare to suggest that these are the only concerns that the public have. But certainly from the feedback that we've had, these are the primary ones of most of the arguments outside of the detailed planning stem from these three things. Can you control underground coal gasification? What are the effects of subsidence? What about groundwater contamination? So I'd like to go through each of those. First of all, if you speak to any fireman in the street, he'll tell you you need three things for a fire. You need combustible material, you need oxygen, and you need an ignition source. Causing fires at shallow depth have caused problems and will cause problems in the future. There's no doubt about that. When I was national surveyor, I was aware of problems in the north of England with coal seams on fire. But coal seams at great depth have not caused environmental problems. And I know, and I'm sure other mining people in this room will know, that um, there was a fire in a coal mine last year, and as a result of the fire, the mine closed. But there's no doubt about it, when they cut off the oxygen to that mine, that fire will go out. There's centuries of evidence to prove that it goes out. And for instance, there's nobody in this room this afternoon can tell me of a deep mine in South Wales which is still causing a problem because of an underground fire. It's just not true. So deep UCG, just like deep mining, would be the combustion is stopped by shutting off the oxygen. And again, back to health and safety, the regime that's in place at the moment for safety would ensure that at the end of the day, the valves can be shut off on top of the poles and no oxygen will go down and it is extinguished. And then, as I said, you can speak to any fireman in any fire station when there's no oxygen, the fire goes out. So how do we get to this stage? Um, I said my background is in mining and the first underground mining men worked like this action shows in the 1600s, they had no supports, they knew nothing about standard supports, they moved with naked lights until one day somebody had an ignition because there was a build up of gas. And so men learned the hard way by losing their lives that you needed number one to support the roof and number two to deal with the gas. And when you got to the stage of timber supports, and this is a very famous section from the 19th century, you had this chap who from then on was called a fireman. And again, men will tell you from the 1980s and 1990s, the man in charge of pre-shift inspections and the man primarily in charge of safety of men underground was called a fireman. And it's set back to this chap, whose job it was before the men worked to walk in with a taper and raise it slowly to the roof until the methane was ignited. Now we also know from our history books that as well as methane, there were definitely underground fires. And if you look on the internet, you'll find that by 1914, which is 100 years ago, the Mines Department in London received evidence from virtually every coal field in the country to say that they had underground coal fires taking place in their mines. And men worked in those conditions, and men, perhaps in this room, will remember some of those conditions. But those fires with that coal, they all were extinguished when there was no oxygen. In some cases, and again when I was a national surveyor, I know that there was more problems with coal fires underground in the Midlands than there were down here in South Wales. And what they used to do was to enhance the process of getting rid of the oxygen, they had actually put nitrogen in, which again is something that we were doing UCG. But there is no doubt about it, there is nothing new in underground coal fires. The history books are full of them. 
That's a photograph of the front page of the onshore borough regulations. And as I said, in this country, we've got a very strict regime dealing with safety. And you will not drill a borough in this country unless you comply with all of those requirements, as well as the planning requirements, as well as the environmental requirements, you must comply with those. And as I said, there have been dozens of boroughs drilled in this area, and people know that they've been drilled in this area without problems. So if we go on to coal mine and subsidence, the book on the right-hand side there, which is um, produced through people in Nottingham University, <clears throat> deals with every aspect of subsidence. It deals with subsidence in limestone, it deals with subsidence in tin mines, it deals with subsidence in coal mines. The book on the left hand side, the orange one, is the Substance Engineer's Handbook. British coal were in a position, they came into existence in 1947, and by 1950, coal mining subsidence was a major problem in this country. And so the government passed legislation to make sure that people had a remedy against coal mining subsidence damage. And it's probably of greater importance in the past than it is today, because obviously we're only down now to a handful of deep mines. But anybody with a subsidence problem associated with coal mining has a remedy. But the Orange Book provides a means of predicting coal mining subsidence from deep mining. And there's no doubt about it that because it's based on sort of 40 years of research, it's been accepted by all sorts of people and stupidity bodies. For instance, when I was in the Midlands, one of my duties was to engage with British Rail because we used to undermine the high-speed rail track from Edinburgh to London. And we used to use that handbook to predict how much ground movement would take place and they would do works on the line to make sure that it didn't stop the train running. We also undermined high pressure gas mains in consultation with British Gas using the same predictive method. So anybody in this room who wants to predict coal mining subsidence in the UK from voids created at great depth have to look at that book. And I'm sure that everybody in this room will accept that subsidence does occur. And the only reason it occurs is that the void underground closes. It doesn't stay open. When you're talking about deep coal mining, which is different from shallow. So if we look first of all at shallow, because this sketch does help you to understand what's happening in some of the shallow UCG instances around the world. Where the void in the sea If you can imagine there was a void started there in the whole sea, there isn't much cover above it. Gradually that void will move up through the coal, up through the rock, and cause a collapse at the surface. But eventually, as the sea gets deeper, you reach a point where that void becomes choke filled. And nothing happens at the surface. But also, when you're in this zone, you have fissures created, and so you can see that if you try to do UCG in this scenario, that as the void, as the coal is burnt, these fissures would go up, and it's very difficult to control an underground fire.